the critical task of the university has multiple meanings. At least we can say two fundamental meanings. On the one hand, the critique, the radical, the short critique of the neoliberal transformation of the university and the connection between this transformation of the university and the overall material processes we are uh, living today. But on the other hand, he's discussing, analyzing in theory and practice the potentiality of the critical potentialities of the university as a space for the, uh, the development of alternatives to this neoliberal globalization. Uh, so looking at the university more as a, a space of intersection of conflictual logics than uh, a monolithic space some way outside overall processes we are living in. So today in, in this panel we will approach the, the topic of the critical task of the university let's say generally and then we will discuss and analyze some fundamental dimension of the topic in a more detailed uh, discuss. We will open our discussion with uh, one way, with a talk uh, titled Challenges to and of Humanities, a Chinese perspective. So uh, thank you one way for being here and I'll give you the word. Thank you very much. It's very great pleasure and a great honor to be invited here, join you to the discussion of the task, critical task of universities. I choose the topic here, folks on the humanities. I, I will talk on this. Uh, let me start it from a very brief story. It's my own, st uh, the, the, some stories that uh, talking about the, uh, the missions or the task, critical task of university in European tradition or in China. It's almost, I think it's uh, quite long ago. It's a 2001, just before the September 11. Uh, Jacques Derrida came to Beijing. That was his first visit to China. I give uh, one story about him and our discussion, because that discussion uh, was about the task of the university and the humanities. Um, it's interesting, he, when he arrived in the very early morning in, in, in Beijing, and um, after the check-in hotel, immediately he went to Tiananmen Square. As, and another was the, the Beihai Park in the center part of Beijing. So why he was, you know, the Tiananmen Square, a lot of the stories happened in the whole 20th century. May Force movements, Zhong Force, and all things, different kind of the events happened there. So why he was taking photos near the Mao Memorial Hall, because after the uh, Mao died, he was buried there, there was a memorial hall there. So his camera broke down. The philosopher commented humorously that he, afterwards he came to our editorial office. At that time, I was the editor, chief editor of Dozhu Magazine. Uh, he said that uh, Mao was truly a powerful figure as his negative capacity could negate everything, including the photography. So his words about the photos, I think, remind me of the image of China in the minds of the European intellectuals in the 1960s. So he talked about that in that sense. And, he, and then he went to, afterwards he went to Beihai Park. It's interesting, he came across an elderly lady uh, who practicing the calligraphy guided his hands in hand, taught him to write a tongue poetry uh, on the stone paved ground with a mob dipped in water. 
he was fascinated by the writing for disappearance of this elderly lady. So these are two things. One is a cultural cultivation. It's not only the for aristocracy, but for the every people, citizens, that the elderly ladies, they practice their own calligraphy, painting, and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, it was a modern tradition, mainly influenced by the Western intellectual tradition, enlightenment and the critical issue. So that's why his comments on the negativity was like that, though it is a short story. But afterwards, when he came to our editorial office together with a group of the Chinese intellectuals, uh, he talked about the question of the university. One of his basic arguments was that, the, in principle, the university ought to be a site where questions, questions regarding truth, the nature of hum humanities, the history of mankind, and so on, should be raised with independence and without, without condition, namely a place where one can unconditionally resist and differ. The absolute independence of the university manifests itself in this process of questioning without condition. This is apparently an idea of university, an idea that in practice attempts to assert itself, but has been negated repeatedly in the history, in the reality, for different reasons. Hence, the university is not only a place for professional training, but also a belief, a duty, and a responsibility. For him, the true way to redeem the democracy lies in this idea and the practice of university. The university must insist on its independence as it participates in social life, since understanding of the university and the humanities is premised on inquiry without condition. These two concepts diverged from the types of the institutions and the disciplinary division we normally refer to. He talked about how the philosophy separated itself from the sphere of theology through the inquiry without a condition. I think here that we are in the Bologna is one of the cases and elucidated that the deconstruction was in this sense not a negation of enlightenment but certain kind of the new vision of the Enlightenment in a contemporary context. So, so this is the, uh, he also talked about the transformation in the globalization, internet time, and so on and so forth. That was still the new reality we are facing. I mentioned this story partly because after his lecture at the Dushu Vaccine, the roundtable discussion, he, we had the, the, the chat, he raised the two questions for me that he asked me from what cultural tradition did the university emerge in China? And does the Confucianism, for example, the main trad cultural tradition, contain the sort of the inquiry without, con without condition of the European university? So that's his two questions for me. So when I prepare these presentations, I, I remember it suddenly, I recall what he raised the questions for me for these. So I try to answer these kind of the questions here. Maybe we need to, in order to understand the challenges of humanities and the university, we need to understand what kind of the characteristics of university, historical characteristics of university and humanities in China, that uh, the, w w what kind of the historical cultural backgrounds. I think that uh, from the perspective of history, the humanities have in China have three characteristics. This overlaps with Europe, but some difference. The first, the humanities as we think of them today, developed during the process of the nation state formation, not directly from the question from within the theological world, but really in the process of the na nation state formation, were deeply influenced by the European and American universities 
and are closely associated with the self-image of a modern nation-state. So in that sense, the University of Modern China was neither developed directly from the tradition of imperial academy, nor a direct inheritor of private learning as the fruit of the westernization movement and the reforms in modern China, late 19th century, it aimed at preparing students with practical skills and replacing the examination system, which can be dated back to the thousand years before, seeing no need for humanities. Before the examination systems was terminated in the later in 1905, both the official and the private education systems were inextricably linked with the system, which began, began in the Sui Dynasty in the 605 years, fully developed in Tang Dynasty and matured in the Song Dynasty. That was the 10th century. Prospered in the Ming and the Qing, that the 14, Ming was 14th century, 16th century, Qing was 17th century down to the early 20th century. So before its decline was brought about by the boats and the cannons of Western powers. So that in the, the modern humanities and the modern task was the reaction to that challenge of the so-called national crisis and during the colonial time, imperialist uh, era. So the 18th century European Enlightenment scholars celebrated the examination system in China as it replaced the aristocratic systems for selecting the officials. In history, many talented people were able to pass through the examination to become capable officials. It was precisely because the examinations aimed at official selection, however, that many schools of scholars thought lost their vitality in becoming officialized. In the later Qing, new Confucian education centered on the classics and eight-leg essays, classical style essays, could no longer meet the demands of the time. The new system of education, however, was not the result of uh, enlightenment as the event in the European history, but originated from the need for modern military technology. The first university in the history of modern Chinese education was Beiyang Naval School, also called the Tianjin Naval College, founded in August 1881, following the recommendation in the Li Hongzhang that the Prime Minister memorial to the throne. So with the Yan Fu, the future president of the Peking University, as its instructor in chief, that was a very interesting Overlaps because Yan Fu was the first president of Peking University. It was thought as a real, the, the universal, comprehensive university in China. He himself was trained in Britain for the naval studies, naval knowledge. But he, he failed to become an office, naval officer, but became, instead, he became a very famous translator of the Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, Junks. Uh, Huxley, uh, the, uh, Spencer, and so on and so forth. He, he translated so much of the classical, the 19th, 19th century classics in the Western history. So, but in any case, these are kind of the combination of the military construction of the university together with these European knowledges about 19th century, legal knowledge, economics, humanities, and so on and so forth. So, these are the, 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 the very interesting the, the, uh, beginning. Then moved to the, the, the capital university that the, the Jing Shi Da Xue Tang, later the Peking University, was established during the Hundred Days Reform in 1898, according to the, uh, the principles of so-called national learning as the substance, Western learning the function use national and Western learning together to observe their way of cooperation. Courses were divided into two categories, general courses, specialized courses, 
In 1910, there were seven disciplines, including the classics, the law and the politics, literature and the history, science, agriculture, engineering and the business, and so on and so forth. The classical studies were traced back to the really Confucian, long Confucian traditions. There were new divisions such as the humanities, social sciences, and the natural sciences at that time. No such taxonomy, but a certain kind of the divisions of knowledge were there. So in modern China, military, industry, political motivations facilitated the birth of university, the product of national salvation of survival. As such, it is not possible to elucidate the birth of the university in modern China using the framework of inquiry without condition, of the enlightenment that was contained within the European theology. Perhaps we can compare the new cultural moment of the 1919 to the inquiry without condition of European enlightenment. Actually, that was thought as the China's new enlightenment. Most of the participants were the scholars teachers and the students. But that moment was happened outside of the campus. It's a kind of the culture moments and there is a lot of the, the, the social, economic and the cultural issues in that time. So at its very origin, the birth of university and the humanities in, sorry, uh, in modern China were closely associated with concerns for national destiny and with the clash of Eastern and West, so-called. The inquiries that were raised largely derived from the persistent debates on why China had become backward and defeated, why the West was prosperous and powerful, and how the civilizations of China and of the West differed. The birth of the modern university was closely linked with science and technology, and the formation of discipline was also inseparable from the notion of science, actually. So this is the first, I think, the, 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 the characteristic. The second, the, the humanities came into being as, like, I mean, in general, in the West, as theolo theological learning and the China, the classical, Confucian classical learning, gradually lost its sacredness and the dominance, and they developed so-called post-theological and the classical or the secular values for human beings. There were three, actually, in order to talk, as I said, that the, the, the origin of modern uni university in China was very late compared to the Bologna University was very young. But it's not necessarily mean that, that there were no longer traditions for the education systems in China. There were three, at least, the origins of the university in China. The all historical roots, not the origins, maybe. First, it was derived from the official system of imperial academy the name Taishi originated in Zhou Dynasty, but as a system of higher education, it was founded during the reign of the Emperor Wu of the Han, Han Dynasty. That was almost in the uh, uh, in in the 135 BC. That the Emperor Wu had the Imperial Academy built in the capital, established positions for the erudites. Now we call the Bo Shi, almost translate the same as a doctor, as a degree. So that's why some people also argue that the European tradition about the degree system was also partly came from that the impacts for the, yeah, the very early tradition in China too. In the later historic periods, the subject studies Imperial Academy expanded to included like a book of change, the book of poetry, the book of documents, the book of rights, the three commentary on the spring and autumn annuals, and so on and so forth. Basically, that was not theor uh, theological, but very much the, the classical, and uh, is a, the official knowledge. Secondly, there was another tradition 
a tradition of private learning that predated the imperial college system. As far as the inquiry without condition is concerned, the tradition of private learning, what we call the Sizhue, and academic academies of classical learning was a more fertile resource for the development of modern discipline of the humanities than the imperial college. So-called private learning is contrasted with the official education system, often traced back to the spring and autumn period. That was the, about the 770 to the 476 BC, when the Confucian, Mozi, Lao, uh, Lao Zi, and the legalist learning were most influential. Confuci those, were the, the, those masters were sought as the founders of the private learning, that long tradition in China. The third one, the historical roots of the Chinese high education, I think, is in the Tang Dynasty, mainly the Buddhism. Buddhism thrived so that the temples also functioned as schools. The great Tang Dynasty record of the Western regions by Xuanzang and notes that the Nalanda Vihara temple in India was the center for the scholarship with about the 1,500 teachers where over 10,000 monks, including Xuanzang and others from China, studied the Buddha Dharma. So there was a free debate there. So that's recorded by the Chinese monks in, the, the, in, in, in India. So that was a Naranda Vahara, but is hence regarded as the origin of the university in India. But these are, from my point of view, were mainly the historical roots, cannot be thought as the, symbol, the, the direct origin for the humanities now. The humanities and the liberal education are the soul of university. In China, humanities sustain a long and rich tradition, but they only became part of the program of a modern university as recently as the 20th century. The classical learning in China was categorized according to the diverse schemes, such as the six arts, the seven epitomes, or the four branches. Research and education were carried out in institutions such as schools of classical learning, including the imperial college and private academic, academics, and in the Buddhist temples at Mahara. It was at the end of 19th century, and mainly in the 20th century, the humanities were formally established according to the system of the modern university and its disciplinary principles. So this is a second background. The lastly, the humanities were born in the competition for the dominance with the sciences. They were deeply influenced by modern scientific methodology, but at the same time attempted to prove their independent status as different from science in their goals and methods. The humanities and liberal education are the areas where the traditional and the modern, modern can best negotiate with each other because they aim to understand the human experience and develop human values. So that is, I think, it's a, the, the, the very important competition with. But at the beginning, it was within the scientific the taxonomy rather than an autonomous domain out of the science, natural science. So in that sense, we need to think about the, what's the meaning of the science in the 19th and the 20th century there. The word science in Chinese pronounced as a culture is one of the most widely used keywords in 20th century China. If we look at the main force movements, two slogans, science, democracy. The science is even more important than the democracy. It's much more, it's, so even the conservatives cannot resist the science. So there was a real authority, the resources of the authority. But the earliest the sources came from the Japanese Mingji scholar, Nishi Amani, who in 1874, in the Miloko Zashi, translated the English word science using the Chinese characters for the culture. 
Nietzsche was deeply influenced by positivist philosophy of Auguste Comte and John Stuart Mill, Mills. And the term Kirche was produced under the influence of Comte's branches of learning. So called Kirche is a branch of learning. So then they translated into the science as a Kirche. Besides the natural sciences, it also included the religion, morality, art, society together providing a universal method that was generally applicable, he translated the philosophy respectively as a study of nature and the principle that all came from the Song Confucian philosophy. It's all the study of principle, that the heavenly principle, Tian Li Li Xue, the study of the exhausting principle, study of the strivings of the wise, the wisdom of the wise, study of strivings of our wisdom, and I finally came to st settled upon the study of wisdom, Zhe the philosophy and the science were linked together. The first part for, and for him, he stated, I quote, all of the sciences and the te techniques have one thread running through them, which is very critical because having established a unified outlook in study and the technique, people's activities can be organized Society's order can be stabilized. Family and the state become powerful and rich. The study typify, typify the superman, thus establish a unified outlook and exhausting the subtleties of study technique was very important. So what's the, the, the outlook, the metaphysical? Why was so important? Obviously mean that the reconstruction of the society with the emperor, new em Japanese emperor as the top, that was directly linked to the cosmos. That was, they can organize the whole order of the knowledge, the whole order of the, the society. So that was the early translation of science together with the metaphysics as the guiding principle above that. So for Chinese case, like Yan Fu, as a, the most important translate, he also translated the Huxley and some Western sociology. So he replaced the metaphysics with the so-called Qingxue, the sociology, as the top. You can compare with that before, the, even he was a more politically, later he even supported the, 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 uh, the emperors, but actually that also shows the difference that a certain kind of the Republican Revolution emerged from there. So it was not the metaphysics linked to the emperorship, but some sociology, a kind of the order for the society. All the people can participate, but into, organized into the new structure of the society emerged. So in that sense, the science was not only natural science, but the whole order of the society and the whole order of the cosmos. So that was the taxonomy. That's why the science was so important. The concept was not only the taxonomy of knowledge, but the dominant, the guiding process, re by, which replaced the old idea of so-called heavenly principle as a supreme principle in the Confucian orders. So, but what happened in the, uh, in the late, from later Qing and, uh, and, uh, and the, in the 1920s during the process of the formation of the modern university? Because during the later Qing, the so-called civilizations and the competition between them held important historic meaning for China's scientific concepts. People believe that the scientific research and the re reluctant social rules, uh, resultant social rules were the major reason that the Western society had won in the competition for civilizations. According to this paradigm, the importance of science originated from the judgment concerning the new circumstances at that time and it didn't originate in science itself. With such a backdrop, later Qing scientific publications develop a method for understanding science during the debate on the civilizational conflicts with a major characteristic of this understanding being the situation of science within the relations 
of the Eastern and the Western civilizations, spiritual or the material, so as to the investigate the significance of science. So the debate took the culture, the Wenhua, or the civilization, Wenming, the culture as its key points. The focus of the argument was over which culture and its values could be taken as a standard or the goal for the establishing the changing direction of China society, culture, and the nation. We can largely summarize these basic views in following schemes for the many Chinese literati and the intellectuals. Eastern civilizations equal to metaphysics, equal to the art, equal to the opinion, equal to metaphysics, metaphysical talk, or the nominal private morality and the returning to the past, now nostalgic for the past. That was the Chinese culture and the Indian culture for them. The Western civilization equal to the science, technology, learning, knowledge, ethics, phenomena, public morality, modernization. That was another direction. But these kind of the debate, the so-called civilizational debates, what can be dated back to the late 19th century, which, which paved the way up to the 1920s. So this is a con consistent debate on that. However, in the 1920s, that was a new debate, replaced these kind of the civilizational debates. That was the debates between the so-called the science and the metaphysics. So that was in the process of the educational reform. It's when the new taxonomy, new division of knowledge within the university space emerged, there was a debate on that. So for them, that the scholars from, they graduated from European University, they came back to China. And one of the leading scholars, whose name of the cousin Chang, who was trained in Hongbao University, and in a political science, but he came back to the my university, Tsinghua University, in 1923, gave a very important talk to talk to the students who are planning to go to America to study the natural science. He said that it's not enough to learn the technology and the natural science, but you need to be a human being, the real human, cultivated human being. So morality, psychology and the aesthetics, literature, and so on and so forth would not belong to the principle of the natural science. Now, all these belong to a new domain, which was very different, separated from the natural science. So that was the beginning of the rise of humanities in China, within the modern universities. So that was I think it's uh, the, 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 the uh, so if I summarize that, the debates from civilizational debates to the debates on the different knowledges, they try to use, to use the diversity of the spirit to oppose the uni universality of science, to use the diversity of cultures and the history to oppose the universalism of scientific civilization, to use the differences in principle of the subject to oppose the united principle of common standard principle of science. This is the historical connotation of the science and the philosophy of life debate as a pair of opposing rhetoric models in debate of the 1920s. By opposing science with the philosophy of life, the problem of history and the culture was ultimately transformed into a problem about abstract and universal knowledge. It was not the difference of Chinese essence and the Western function, like in the 19th century, or the confrontation of the Eastern and the Western civilization, but rather a opposition of science and the metaphysics, physics and the psycho psychology, reason and the intuition which structure the center of the discussion. With these as the axis of the, 
the system of universal sci scientific knowledge began to split apart into incommemorate differing independent fields. That is the field of science and the field of the spirit that later was established as so-called humanities and human sciences, and then to the social sciences too, in between. So the, from the debate over the Eastern and the Western cultures to the debate over science vis-a-vis uh, vis -vis the, the metaphysics, the affirmation of the autonomy, spatial, spatial status, and the internal values of culture was incorporated into a rationalized classification of knowledge. Defense of the autonomy of ethics, aesthetics, feelings, and a culture finally secured their positions in the rationalized knowledge of system or the empire of science. National education and the professional education based on the new social division of labor constituted the basic framework work of the educational systems. I think these are all the fate of the humanities. So when the humanities not as a general questioning without condition, but the withdraw into the space as a discipline, actually they affirm the dominance of the power of science. That was related to, to the state and other, all the different the, the, the authorities. So these three characteristics of the humanities raise the following questions that we talk about the challenges now. First of all, we need to rethink about the humanities in the age of globalization. Because basically, the, the humanities, in the modern humanities in China, was emerged in the process of the nation state formation. Now, how to deal with these, the new text? How should we analyze the relationship between the humanities and also the diverse humanistic tradition? That was another. Because if we talk about the taxonomy, the basically now the taxonomy about the other uh, humanities, social science, the natural science, these kind of the was came, completely came from the Western tradition. So in the globalization, I think in the, in the new age, how to deal with the diverse tradition of cultures, I think, the different knowledges, the taxonomy system. So how should we analyze the relationship between the humanities as a field of as a space for the inquiry of without condition and the search for so-called soft power. Now the humanities were also developed in China. Investments on the humanity and social science may be the biggest in the world now. It increased so much, but the main purpose was the soft power. So this is the, the, the that's the, the new challenge. These are another small stories because I uh, participated in another forum for talk about the global situation in the, uh, uh, the humanities. And eventually, it's really interesting that uh, when the different country, the, the, the participants from different countries complain about the shortage of the, the funds and so on and so forth, comparatively speaking, mainland China and Taiwan maintain that the the more, much more investments on, in the fields, all for the competition of the soft powers, rather than the so-called critical tasks, raise the critical task of humanities and, the, and these issues. So that I think it's a huge, I, I, I will say that now China had the National Social Science Foundation, and in each province they have their own branches the huge money, it's, I don't know the, how much now, is a very big project for, for, for these kind of the, uh, discussions. So basically the one challenge in the globalization was that one con continuation of the, of the uh, nation state, of, the continuation of the nation state structure competed for the power, but the softer power. And the humanities as a softer power rather than the critical space. That was uh, we need to face these big challenges. Second, I think that, that we need to think, rethink about the humanities in the so-called uh, 
so-called the post-secular age, I think. Because economic globalization has not led to the thorough dis, so-called disenchantment of the world as some modern thinkers claim it would. On the contrary, the secular life developed as the, the religions, the diverse, diverse traditions were reinvigorated. Even in China, a country widely regarded as a relatively secular, that was the image of, of the, uh, the uh, European Enlightenment figures. They thought China was the, the uh, secular, European was the religious at that time. But now, it's a different types of religious revival have occurred. How should the task of humanities be redefined in these changed contexts? Is the category of post-secular age a proper term to describe and define the phenomena in non-Western countries? Because basically, we talk about the secular and the secularization. Is I, I would want to quote like uh, uh, the Indian scholars like uh, uh, Rajiv uh, Bhagwan. He raised the issue. He, he, he gave a lecture at the Tsinghua University. He talked about the East, the European secularism, secular enough. The basic argument was that the secularization or the secularism was happened within European society, a much more, less, more homogeneous religious society. They had no such experience like China, India, the massive populations with different the huge religions living together. So in that sense, the new situation, the new task, critical task of the humanities and the universities have to face the different historical the conditions and the, their trajectory. For example, here in Europe society, that was the first time for European society, so large scale, I mean in a large scale, to confront or the, to, to meet the situation, the massive migration from the different backgrounds into. So how to deal with these kind of the conditions? So that was also the task of, for China because when the, 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 the development of the soft power, one of the issues was the re-emergence of the, uh, the, the so-called the, 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 uh, the national learning, re-emergence. So it's already time, so uh, five minutes, that's enough. Okay, <laughs> that's uh, absolutely enough. So this is, the, the, I think it's uh, the second the, the issues. Three, the third one, I think we need to think about the, the, uh, the how to deal with the taxonomy, to break the boundaries of different di disciplines. Not only in China, there was a different the, 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 the taxonomy of knowledge, but even in the West, you already had uh, different arguments. As a, as a friend from Oxford University remind me of the fact that uh, when we talk about the, the different taxonomy of knowledge, he said that the, the Greek philosophers of 20th century expressed a very different views about the nature, for example, of philosophy and about the re relationship between the philosophy and the science. And when, for example, on the one hand, Bertrand Russell, he was very influential in the 20th century China, insisted that philosophy cannot be fruitful if divorced from empirical science. But on the other hand, the Wittgenstein claimed that the desire to imitate the science leads philosophers into the complete darkness. Is philosophy a humanistic discipline in that sense? How is it related to the other subjects in humanities and to science and mathematics? From the Asian perspective, great thinkers as, such as Kang Youwei, Zhang Taiyan, Mao, and Gandhi were all great philosophers. So it is not necessary to limit ourselves to philosophy as a self-contained academic subject. So that was, I think, it, when we think about the, the, the reform of the humanities, we also need to think about the boundary, how to go beyond that boundary to think about that. The last, last issue, I think, we need to rethink the humanities and the new developments of science and technology. 
The status of the modern humanities was establishing its relationship with, the, with and the difference from science. However, now, the artificial intelligence, genetic technology, ecological science, among others, are impacting every aspect of human society, not only the human society, but also the human body. So, how should the relationship between the humanities and the sciences be reassessed in the light of these developments? How can the humanities, on the one hand, to some extent, benefit from these developments in science while remaining critical and reflexive? Because before that, we saw that we, the, the struggle for the autonomy of humanities within that, the taxonomy, or within the, the, the framework of the, the university, actually eventually forced the humanities, lost the capacity to really get into the new developments of the science, natural science, which not to strengthen our power, but to weaken our capacities. So in that sense, we also need to think about this when we talk about the critical task of the humanities and the university. We really need to rethink about the constitution, some basic foundational principle for the humanities as a discipline was we need to rethink about that in this new context. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, one way for this historical fresco of the humanities in China and the effects on uh, contemporary society in China and more in general on the critical tasks of the humanities in contemporary society. So now we have Sandro Mezzadra, Professor Sandro Mezzadra from the University of Bologna uh, talking on the figure of the activist scholar within and against the global university and after Gisela Catanzaro will give a first comment before opening our collective discussion. So thank you, Sandro, and it's up to you now. Well, thank you, Rafael, and uh, I would like uh, to start by uh, warmly and not rhetorically thanking uh, the conveners of uh, this uh, conference for uh, inviting me and uh, for uh, giving me the opportunity, first of all, to reflect upon uh, the question of uh, the critical tasks uh, of uh, the university today. After uh, uh, the brilliant uh, uh, talk of uh, uh, Wang Wei, after his uh, kind of uh, genealogical reconstruction of uh, the humanities, uh, the status of uh, the humanities uh, in the Chinese uh, experience, uh, I will uh, propose a uh, uh, kind of shift of focus. In a way, uh, I will uh, follow uh, the feminist uh, slogan, and I uh, will start with myself. I will start uh, with uh, some uh, kind of uh, remarks uh, upon uh, my specific uh, positionality within uh, uh, the topic that uh, we are uh, discussing in the first uh, panel of uh, uh, the conference. Three questions uh, uh, arise uh, when uh, one is confronted with uh, his or uh, her own uh, personal engagement. Uh, when uh, one uh, is called to ter is called to come to terms uh, with the, and to publicly account for. Uh, what he or she has done and does in order to be up to the basic aim 
to combine scholarly work, teaching within an academic institution, and political activism. Let me just say that uh, this aim has uh, been uh, crucial to my own life uh, and work since I started to study at uh, the university in this country, although not in this city, in Genoa, at the very beginning of uh, the 1980s. And I wanted to uh, explicitly acknowledge uh, my indebtedness to a single experience uh, that was key to the development uh, of uh, Italian uh, operaismo, autonomist Marxism, uh, in the 1960s and in the 1970s, which means uh, to the experience uh, of the Institute of Political Sciences that was uh, directed for several years uh, by Tony Negri in uh, Padova. The combination of uh, high theory, militant uh, investigation, and uh, revolutionary practice uh, that characterized uh, the work uh, at uh, the Institute until the imprisonment uh, of uh, most of its members uh, on April 7, 1979, is a truth of uh, a peculiar legacy and attitude that continues uh, to circulate uh, among uh, young activists uh, in Italy, in a way at least relatively immunizing uh, them against the anti-intellectualism it is widespread uh, within social movements uh, in uh, other parts of the world. That combination has been and continues uh, to be for me an essential source uh, of uh, inspiration, independently of the obvious need to redefine and radically rethink the meaning of uh, each of the terms uh, I quoted uh, before, high theory, militant investigation, revolutionary practice, in a completely different uh, historical, theoretical, and political conjuncture. So in uh, the title uh, of uh, my talk today, uh, I uh, mentioned the figure of uh, the activist uh, scholar. And this is not because I completely endorse it and aim at presenting uh, a full-fledged theoretical elaboration upon this figure. On the contrary, I think that uh, the figure of uh, the activist scholar is quite problematic on both sides of the label which means, uh, on the one hand, regarding uh, the problems uh, implied by the fact that uh, in many parts of the world, well beyond the so-called North-South uh, divide, a growing number of activists uh, within social movements are at the same time uh, scholars and not necessarily junior scholars. On the other hand, referring to the often embarrassing kind of predicament of uh, scholars who want to be a witness of uh, their activism uh, within uh, the university. So in the first case, one uh, of the problems that may arise uh, is the fact that uh, the language and the framing of activism tend to be academicized which often leads to a kind of blurring of the difference between an assembly and an academic seminar, or even worse, to difficulties of communication between activist scholars on the one hand and other activists on the other, or society writ large. In the second case, the peculiarity of academic work, including the relations with uh, students can easily go lost. So although, as you see, I am uh, fully aware of the problematic uh, nature of the figure of uh, the activist uh, 
scholar, I nevertheless uh, take it uh, precisely as an index of the myriad problems that the combination of scholarship, academic labor, and activism arises today. These problems, as uh, Veronica Gago has uh, eloquently showed in an article just published uh, in English in uh, Viewpoint magazine, range from the politics of reading implied by political commitment to the vexed question of the need to continuously test the division between intellectual and manual labor. In any case, my own politics of location, the combination as well as the tensions between academic labor and political activism accounts for my specific angle on the question of the critical tasks of the university today. And this does not mean, of course, that I do not acknowledge the relevance of other angles, including the ones provided by the very status of the notion and practice of critique, which is, as you know, a contested status, or by the challenges and transformations that are currently reshaping the landscape of the humanities, a question that has been touched upon in the last part of his talk by Wang Wei. These are all questions that are, in a way, also at the center of my scholarly work. However, if I am called to directly address the critical tasks of the university, I tend to take the question in a kind of existential way, which means that I feel myself in a way obliged to account for the results of the attempt to combine scholarly and teaching work within the university and political activism. And you may well be tempted to ask, uh, account to whom? Well, it's a difficult question. Um, let's say, first of all, account to myself for now. Please allow me this uh, specific politics of location and positionality, which corresponds to an enduring and never-ending uh, reflection uh, upon the relation between uh, the production of theory and its groundedness in the contemporary global predicament. In order to address the question, I will shortly speak of four projects I have been involved in, in different ways and capacities, over the last decade or so. And all these projects are rooted within the university. While I will not talk of the several kind of autonomous projects I have participated and I participate in, like Uninomade and Euronomade, precisely to keep the focus on the university, which is at the center of our deliberations this day. I hope that doing so, uh, shortly speaking of four grounded projects, uh, will uh, allow me to flesh out uh, at the end of my talk, uh, precisely in a more grounded way, some uh, defining characteristics uh, of the figure of uh, the activist scholar that will open up productive angles uh, on the blind spots uh, and pitfalls uh, the figure is confronted with. But there is one more point uh, on which uh, I want to be, I need to be absolutely clear uh, since the beginning. Taking the intertwining of academic labor and political activism as point of entry into the question of the critical tasks of the university today, implies a crucial emphasis on the relation between the university and its outside, and its multiple outsides. These outsides 
continue to be shaped by the ongoing rule of capital, by multiple forms of domination and exploitation that incessantly rework race and gender and deeply reframe subjective experiences and practices, by all the new formations of terror and war that devastate ter territories and populations, by the answering transformations in forms and practices of power and government governmentality. And the list of horrors could easily go on. But for me, it is more important to add that uh, this outside uh, is also shaped uh, by multiple forms of resistance, uh, by multiple struggles, uh, which continue to provide, uh, for me, the necessary viewpoint for articulating critique and imagining combinations between uh, academic labor and uh, political activism. Needless to say, I acknowledge the importance uh, of discussions about what is going on within the university. But what matters from the point of view I take in this particular talk is, I want to repeat it, the relation with the outside. So nevertheless, I have to say at least a couple of words regarding the inside of the university and uh, academic labor in order to be able to discuss their uh, relations uh, with uh, the outside. And allow me to be very classical in uh, this regard and to follow the lead uh, of Max Weber, who asks uh, right at the beginning of his famous talk uh, on science uh, as a vocation, what are, uh, I'm quoting Max Weber, the conditions of science as a vocation and a profession in the material sense of the term, in the material sense of the term? And let's keep in mind the way in which Weber specifies the question, further asking, Second and last quotation. What are the prospects of a graduate student who is resolved to dedicate himself, and luckily we need to add, or herself, professionally to science in university life? Nice question. I mean, what Weber is saying to us is, uh, do you want to understand uh, the condition of a university system? Look at the condition of uh, graduate students uh, who want to start uh, an academic career. Well, answering uh, these questions with respect to the particular condition of this country, of Italy, would be quite embarrassing. So let's take a global perspective, a global viewpoint. But what does it mean to take uh, a global viewpoint on the transformations of the university nowadays. This is a question that was asked in a quite productive way, in my opinion, within the first pro project I want to mention and briefly discuss, the Edu Factory project, which prompted lively and interesting discussions between a number of scholars and activists, including some participants in this conference, such as Stefano Harney, in the first decade of the 21st century. At stake in that particular project was an attempt to imagine and experiment with the establishment of what we call autonomous institutions for the production and circulation of knowledge in a situation characterized by powerful trends toward the emergence of a quote and unquote global university. But these trends, as it is always the case with global trends and dynamics, do not uh, imply a straightforward process of uh, homogenization and 
convergence of university systems all over the world. They rather point to a set of crucial features in the evolution of university systems that have their origins in the Anglophone world and that are translated to mention a crucial question, the question of translation that was brought into the discussion of EduFactory by our friends Naoki Sakai and John Solomon into diverse regional and national contexts in relatively heterogeneous ways. So we know very well these uh, uh, features ranging from the use of specific metrics for research assessment, total quality, wonderful achievement, and ranking of universities, to the recoding of academic labor in terms of entrepreneurial activity and investment rationality. The implication of the transformations prompted by these uh, practices, technologies, uh, and rhetoric are momentous and can be, for instance, observed in the standardization and proliferation, standardization and proliferation of writing that are particularly requested, to go back to Max Weber's point, from graduate and postgraduate uh, students uh, who attempt to do an academic career. But just think uh, of the kind of style that is uh, generated by the specific form of interpellation implied by the practically compulsory use of PowerPoint for presentations at seminars and conferences. But even when it is not at all useful, I mean, you talk about Aristotle and you have to show a statue with uh, the head of uh, the great Greek uh, philosopher. So needless to say, there would be much more to add on uh, this point. For instance, analyzing uh, the, tens the tendency to transfer costs for funding the university system away from governments and towards students with uh, the spread of student debt, which has taken, as you know, gigantic proportions in the US, the policies of international students' recruitment, the transformations of the teaching machine, to borrow Gayatri Spivak's phrase, the hierarchization of academic labor and the related spread of competition, anxiety, and fear within departments and institutes. So the politics of naming and visibility implied by the governance and manipulation of authorship and authoriality is another relevant question, which is connected to shifting and ever more perverse regimes of intellectual property. As anybody who has signed a contract to publish an article in an academic journal, particularly in the Anglophone world, knows uh, even too well. But for the purposes uh, of uh, this talk, it is uh, particularly important to emphasize that the emergence of uh, what we called uh, within uh, the EduFactory project, uh, the global university, also implies a reframing of the relations between the university and its outside. The main point that interests me. The EduFactory Collective analyzed this shift in terms of a pattern of relation between the university and the metropolis that ideally erases the outside. The voracious appetite of the global university that drives it toward its outside. The, the mechanisms of selection and segmentation, the collective rights in a book published in 2009, are no longer based on exclusion, on the rigid confine between who is in and who is out, but on processes of differential inclusion. So this notion of differential inclusion upon which 
uh, Brett uh, Nilsson and I have elaborated in our work on borders and migration nicely captures uh, not merely <laughs> the working uh, of recruitment uh, schemes, both regarding uh, students and faculty, but also the ways in which uh, universities uh, tend nowadays to encode and address society as a whole. And it is almost obvious to note that in these ways, managerial and entrepreneurial rationalities play crucial roles. The widespread use of such words as shareholders and stakeholders to frame the relation between the universities and third parties within European research funding schemes is just an instance of that. And I think that we need to keep in mind this point. We need to keep in mind this point if we want to reflect upon the relation between the university and its outsides. I remember giving a talk some years ago in a squatted social center in Athens, in the framework of a European research project, and addressing the audience with such words as, dear friends, dear colleagues, dear comrades, dear stakeholders. That was a kind of moment of confusion that I think was uh, quite productive uh, for uh, all the participants uh, in that uh, specific uh, project, both uh, scholars, activists, and of course, uh, activist scholars. One can even involve uh, in research projects funded by the European Commission to stay with my own experience, squatted social centers with the goal of contributing to their legitimization and even to hijack some resources and divert them to their funding. But encoding such squatted social centers as stakeholders of a research project, besides not being necessarily easy, is not a neutral, merely technical operation. It has uh, implications uh, one has to remain aware of. And nevertheless, uh, this is an example of the tricky predicament uh, one is compelled uh, to confront if he or she aims at experimenting with the combination of academic labor and political activism uh, within and against the global university. Hijacking resources is a method here. And let me add that the resources are not limited to monetary resources, since they include, to put it shortly, a wide array of infrastructures of knowledge production and circulation. In the remaining three projects uh, that uh, I would like to mention and briefly discussed today, these questions figure prominently. The first one is a summer school organized at the Humboldt University in Berlin in 2013, bearing the title Teaching the Crisis. This is part of an ongoing process which would have never been possible without the engagement and commitment of Manuela Boyajiev, who is also participating in our conference. It resulted in the organization of two more summer schools uh, in 2014 and 2016, and uh, it is characterized by a whole set of organizing principles, including the attempt to put on the same level all participants, be they students or faculty, as far as, as, far as it is possible, of course, and without any ideological kind of denial of the differences in training, expertise, and experience. But the Teaching the Crisis Summer School brought together scholars, students, and activists from several European countries 
to discuss and investigate the effects of uh, the economic crisis in this part uh, of uh, the world. In each university involved in the network, uh, a group of students uh, was formed several months before uh, the summer school to pursue a specific case study. The experience we did uh, in Bologna was really amazing. For a couple of years, we were uh, confronted with a powerful wave of uh, struggles and strikes in the logistical warehouses in the city, as well as in other northern Italian regions, where most workers, up to 100% in many warehouses, are migrants. The students participating in the project were already involved in these struggles as activists, although often with different and even conflicting political positions, which eventually turned out being a kind of added value. The research they did in 2013 is for me an ideal instance of what militant investigation a research and political methodology crucial but uh, in no way limited to Italian uh, operaismo can uh, mean uh, today. The specific outside of the logistical warehouses was definitely not framed in the managerial and entrepreneurial terms that I was mentioning before. Also due to the, specific, to the specificity of the funding scheme we adopted in that occasion. It was rather taken and investigated as a crucial site of exploitation and struggle, and concurrently as a location whose specific grounding cannot be understood without taking into consideration wider networks and assemblages of space, capital, power, and labor. The knowledge produced uh, within uh, that militant investigation was definitely a partial knowledge, knowledge. Since knowledge production was predicated upon the participation in the struggles on the side of uh, migrant workers. Although that uh, knowledge definitely made uh, a modest uh, contribution to the struggles, its relevance is not to be confined to the immediate needs of organization and struggle, since it raised wide-ranging questions regarding, for instance, the relations between logistical and political spaces within the framework of globalization. The research mobilized and, in a way, hijacked academic infrastructure but at the same time, it opened up new spaces of investigation and theoretical work with productive implications, both for the university itself and for the research agenda of the students involved in the project. I think this experience is a good example of a best practice to play with the neoliberal jargon of militant investigation. Although I should add that I use the notion of example in the spirit of Machiavelli, who continually provided historical examples from uh, classical antiquity in his work, while being aware of the fact that things had so dramatically changed in his present that following those examples in a straightforward way had become simply impossible complex labor of conceptual as well as practical translation was rather necessary. So the question of translation figures prominently in my next example, which means in two connected research projects funded by the Australian Research Council and directed by Brett Nielsen and uh, Ned, Ross, Ned Rossiter at uh, Western Sydney University. The first project, uh, Transit Labor, intended to study the transformations of labor, patterns of mobility, and rescaling of space in the Asia-Pacific region, 
against the background of the shifting configuration of capitalism in Asia, and most notably of the emergence of so-called creative industries. The second one, logistical words, is devoted to investigate the quite topical issue of China-led globalization within the framework of the New Silk Road or Belt and Road Initiative. I will not dwell here on uh, the results uh, of the two projects. I will uh, rather focus on a question uh, that uh, I have already mentioned, talking about uh, the militant investigation in Bologna and whose relevance should be clear from the titles and topics of the two projects. To put it very simply, the question can be formulated as follows. How to study global processes in a grounded way this is a question that particularly troubles ethnographers, as you know, since it challenges such basic notions of, for ethnographic research as site, field, and fieldwork. But it has important implications for a number of other domains of uh, academic uh, knowledge production. So the decision we made uh, to tackle this uh, problem was to intensify, on the one hand, theoretical work on the global dimensions of the topics of investigation, while focusing, on the other hand, on three cases in each project. Staging and even dramatizing the tension between these two sides of the research, the global dynamics and the case, the instance, the city, the territory, which seem to require different methodologies, knowledge, and expertise, has been particularly productive and corresponds to a take, to a viewpoint on globalization that Brett, Nilsson, and I attempt to develop in our collaborative uh, uh, work. work. But what interests me more now uh, is to point to another aspect of the work we have been pursuing in these two projects, to a kind of technical and logistical tool that we developed to address the problem of enabling a productive collaboration between scholars and activists coming from abroad or simply from outside, and scholars and activists based in the specific locations uh, that uh, we uh, choose uh, as uh, sites for our uh, investigation. Hmm. This uh, technical and logistical tool is what we call a research platform, which combines uh, digital methodologies with uh, ethnographic techniques in order to make productive the encounter and even these encounters between people based in a specific site of investigation and people coming from abroad or simply from outside. I have not uh, the time to uh, dwell on uh, uh, the technicalities of uh, uh, the research uh, platform, but uh, uh, let me say that uh, uh, this uh, specific uh, uh, tool uh, points to a crucial problem today. It is an example, again, of what is needed in order to combine academic labor and political activists, not merely in the specific locations or uh, in specific locations of national context, but rather at the translocal transnational, transcontinental, and global level. This is a, a question that figures prominently in uh, a fourth project I would have liked to talk about, but I have not the time. I simply mention it. It's a, a, a lab, social movements lab, that I co-direct with Michael Hart at Duke University within the framework of the Academy of Global Humanities and Critical Theory. In this uh, uh, project that we are just starting uh, now, 
both the figure of the activist scholar and the problem of making possible these uh, trans-local, trans-national, trans-continental uh, uh, connections uh, are particularly important. I have five minutes. So let me conclude. It's uh, less than five minutes. The projects I mentioned uh, and uh, briefly discussed uh, are for me all uh, exemplary attempts uh, to work within and against uh, the global university whose uh, emergence uh, was described in the work of uh, Edu Factory, the first project uh, I uh, briefly described. Mm. The differences between the projects are also due to uh, the different kind of funding schemes and uh, national academic environments within which uh, they emerged uh, and uh, uh, developed. It is important to keep in mind these differences, which have uh, relevant implications also for questions of wider political strategy regarding the university. For instance, regarding the meaning of defending the public nature of higher education, while at the same time opening up spaces for the university of the common, to put it with a bit of jargon. There is, moreover, a specificity of uh, academic labor upon which there is uh, a need to reflect particularly in a conjuncture in which processes of financialization are crisscrossing the environment and the working of the university, again, with a variable geometry in different parts of the world. But in each location, what uh, is urgently needed, in my opinion, is to break the self-referential logic that too often shapes even the production of critical and radical theory within the university. Important questions arise regarding the very statute of critical theory when it is considered as a social activity enmeshed within a dense fabric of, so of social practices and relations challenging the university as the exclusive or even privileged site of its uh, production. I want to repeat again my main point. The relation with uh, the outside is crucial in this regard, and the different endeavors to combine academic labor and political activism that I discussed today are precisely examples of more or less successful, of course, attempts to move in that uh, direction. Struggles against oppression, domination, and exploitation for the reinvention of freedom, equality, and the common provide strategic indications about the sites and the topics that can be taken on to organize this kind of militant exploration of the outside to the university. And needless to say, this exploration involves radical and even existential challenges from the angles of the subjectivity of each one who wants to undertake this militant exploration of the outside to the university. In a conversation with Duccio Trombadori, Michel Foucault refers in 1978 to Nietzsche Blanchot and Bataille to conceptually grasp those limit experiences that, as he says, tear the subject from itself. Well, in a way, I am convinced that the main critical task within the university today is to work with patience and passion at the same time to lay the ground for such experiences, potentially tearing all forms of academic subjectivities from BA students to distinguished full professors, including, of course, activist scholars, away from themselves, which also means away from their privileges. Remaining aware of the fact that we are confronted today with the proliferation of figures of academic labor whose privileges are becoming more and more elusive. By the way, I am convinced that such tears 
while raising the question of the limits of the very tool of the project and of its temporality from a political angle, may also figure among the conditions that enable the production of really innovative knowledge. Thank you very much. Hmm.